Hello, and welcome to the fifth webinar in the 2017 Organic Seed Production webinar series, brought to you by the Organic Seed Alliance and the Multinational Exchange for Sustainable Agriculture. This is your host, Alice Formiga from eOrganic, which is the organic agriculture community at extension.org. All our webinars are recorded and available in our archive at extension.org and also on the eOrganic YouTube channel. This presentation will last about an hour and then we'll have time for questions. We'll be reading as many questions as we can out loud after the presentation is over. So today, our presenters are Jared Zeistro and Michaela Colley of the Organic Seed Alliance. They will be discussing cleaning wet and dry seed by hand or using equipment. Presenters will share different farmers' favorite seed cleaning tricks and they will discuss some tools that you can buy or make yourself. So now I am going to hand the screen controls over to our first presenter, Jared Zeistro. Okay, Jared. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Alice. So as Alice said, we're going to be covering seed cleaning and equipment that you would use for cleaning seed. And we're going to cover a, all, let me start off by uh, introducing kind of the necessity of seed cleaning. And I would say that when we when when you talk to organic seed growers and seed growers in general, seed cleaning is one of the liveliest topics of discussion. And the reason for that is that there are a number of reasons why understanding how to efficiently and effectively clean seed is an extremely important part of the, the skill set of being a seed producer. First off, it can often be a make or break expense. And what I mean by that is that for many farms, getting producing a seed crop, getting it from uh, seed through vegetative phase all the way up through harvest and having a, you know rough cleaned seed um, out of the field all of that you know may uh, you know be a not a, a uh, easy task but one in which you know if, if that was as far as you needed to take the crop it would be relatively easy to make it profitable where often the the challenge comes in is getting from rough field clean seed to seed that is ready for delivery to your wholesale customer or in put into packets if you're selling at a retail level. So getting it from um, rough clean to all the way clean can be something where if you do not have the right tools and techniques, all of a sudden what was potentially a, a profitable crop can be unprofitable as you invest um, you know, countless hours of labor trying to get the last little bit of it clean. Second, being able to get well clean seed is an important part of a seed grower's reputation. If you think about, you know, what you're delivering and what your product is, it's seed. And what people see when they look at the seed that you, that you produce is, you know, first off, you know, how mature does it look? You know, does it look like you're, you know, providing, you know, fully ripe seed that's, you know, and secondly, how well does it germinate? But uh, the cleanliness is something that jumps out right away and is something that, you know, when you have seed that is, you know, essentially entirely clean and pure seed, you know, that is part of your reputation as a seed grower. And if you are providing See, that's always a little bit dirty um, that will, can affect your reputation. Third, having clean seed is really important for being able to store your seed for a long time and, and maintain it disease free. Seed is dense and generally hard and uh, because of that it is often relatively immune to um, it, it, it's, it's relatively impermeable to moisture. It's relatively uh, immune to uh, kind of disease. But the chaff, the non-seed material that comes along with uh, rough, clean seed, the, the pieces of stem and leaf, et cetera, all of that you can picture really as being much closer to, you know, a sponge. It's much more porous and less dense and can much more easily absorb moisture and can provide a more hospitable habitat for diseases. So 
removing that chaff from your seed before you put it into the storage is a way to prolong the seed's life and, and prevent the growth of diseases in storage. So I want to give a quick outline of what we're going to be covering today. Uh, first, we're going to be talking just about some of the basics of planning for seed cleaning, what to be thinking ahead about throughout the growing season to ensure that you're going to have success getting your seed clean. And then I'm going to quickly walk through the basics of seed cleaning before going into equipment. I'd like to point out that we have in the past done a much more in-depth uh, webinar on the specifics of cleaning seed. And with the end of this webinar, we have a link to last year's seed cleaning webinar that will, if, if you are interested, you can go and refer to that and get a lot more depth in how to clean seed. And this uh, webinar will be covering the basics for those of you that need a brief review or just to give some structure and background as we introduce the equipment. So we'll give the basics of seed cleaning followed by a discussion of uh, equipment, both equipment that people purchase and equipment that you can build yourself that will allow you to more efficiently and effectively clean seed. So starting out with planning ahead for cleaning. So a big part of being able to get clean seed happens before you ever get to the cleaning stage. And first off, it's thinking about how are you going to clean and making sure that you have the resources necessary when you get to the stage where you need to be cleaning. So one of the things with seed crops, and I think we've mentioned this on other webinars, is that they often have a slightly different life cycle in terms of their labor and um, space requirements relative to say vegetable crops where if you are running say a csa you may have a certain rhythm where you're you know planting on a you know weekly schedule and harvesting you know on a bi-weekly schedule and this is kind of this constant push of labor throughout the season with seed crops what you often have is there's a certain lull you know as the seed crop crops are growing in the field where you have to keep an eye on them, make sure that, you know, disease and, and weeds aren't getting out of control, but, um, you know, they're more or less doing their own thing. However, when it comes time to be able to harvest and turn around, get that seed harvest and cleaned and out the door, there becomes this large spike in the resources that you need to be putting towards your seed crop. And so you need to plan ahead. You need to think, okay, when it is this time of year, you know, se September and the rains are starting and I need to get the seed out of the seed crops out of the field and threshed and dried and cleaned. Do I have sufficient, you know, covered space to be able to manage that seed crop, to bring it out of the field, to have room enough to, to do a good job of drying and cleaning? Do I have the tools and equipment that I'm going to need? You want to make sure that you have those, you know, in advance of when you need them. So that way they'll be ready and you know how to use those tools and equipment in an efficient and effective way. And finally, do I have the labor? Again, this is one of the more labor intensive parts of growing a seed crop is getting that seed to, you know, complete cleanliness. One of the key principles of to understand as you are thinking about improving your ability to get clean seed is realizing that clean seed cleaning happens often before you get to uh, even to, to harvest and certainly to the stage of, of cleaning. And what I mean by that is that part of having seed clean is making sure that you are minimizing the amount of uh, unwanted materials that get mixed in with your seed in the first place. For example, uh, weed seed and dirt in particular, as well as um, you know extra chaff, extra non-seed material. Um, you know, weed seed and dirt um, can provide myriad problems when it comes to getting your seed clean because they can be the 
a lot of seed cleaning, as we'll see in a second, involves separation based on size and based on density. And dirt and weed seed in particular can be, you know, the same size and density as your uh, target seed crop. And so getting those out can be a lot harder than taking the time up front to prevent them from getting in and mixed in with your seed. So, you know, some of what you can be doing, and we've mentioned this on other webinars, is, you know, say prior to harvesting your seed crop, go through and do a final uh, weeding of your seed field. Pull out those, you know, large uh, mustards that are, you know, about to um, shatter. You know, remove, you know, weeds, you know, the, the lamb's quarter that's going to, you know, be having seed mixed in with your seed crop, you know, before you harvest. You know, likewise, as you're harvesting, think about ways to prevent seed from get your seed crops from getting mixed with dirt. You know, you may want to lay your seed crops as they're um, finishing drying. You may want to lay them on some floating row cover to keep them um, separate. Um, second key principle in terms of thinking smart about seed cleaning is volume reduction. This is a big part of seed cleaning, especially initially is trying to rapidly get the volume of material that you're working with from you know essentially you're starting with the entirety of the plant and seed combined um, trying to separate out as much of that chaff as you can uh, easily and effectively before you start the more intensive process and certainly trying to kind of minimize the amount of effort that you put into moving large volumes of material around so how, you know, thinking hard about what, how, how much of the initial cleaning you can just do in the field, um, in place before you start moving your, your seed crops around. Third principle here is the idea of maintaining separate lots as uh, appropriate and, and, and certainly labeling them. And what I mean by this is that, for example, say that you are, you uh, cut your seed crop and you're allowing it to uh, dry in windrows, laying down, resting on um, floating row cover. And what you'll find is that as that seed uh, continues to dry and finish up in windrows on the row cover, some of the seed will have shattered and fallen down onto the row cover. And you may get, you know, a decent amount of seed, but that seed that's lying down on the row cover will be the most likely to kind of have a chance of getting, getting mixed up with uh, rocks and dirt and weed seed and mouse droppings. And so rather than taking that seed that is, um, you know, kind of more contaminated and mixing it back in with the seed that's still attached to the plants, which is going to be, you know, less contaminated, it's better to kind of divert those into two separate lots, you know, having your, you know, kind of dirtier lot you know, labeled and, and, and kind of destined for potentially a more intensive seed cleaning. And then the seed that's still attached to your plants, you know, can then go towards a cleaner lot that you, you know, maintain and clean separately. The moral story is, you know, if you have a situation where you've got, uh, for whatever reason, you know, um, seed from part of your field or, you know, uh, Part of the your process that ends up dirtier it's easier to maintain those as separate and not mix the dirt in or the non-seed material in um, it's better to try and maintain those as separate lots rather than getting it all mixed together and then having to put in an intensive effort on your whole seed crop to get them cleaned out later um, fourth thing here is using tools that are appropriate for your scale and this is really a key piece of uh, advice and it's one that you'll see seed producers spend a lot of time thinking about which is that there really isn't necessarily a one-size-fits-all tool for seed cleaning there's not, not only are there different tools that are most appropriate for different seed crops but there are different tools that are most appropriate for different scales um, some tools work best for um, certain quantities of seed crops, as uh, Michaela is going to be pointing out when we talk about dry seeded crops, you know, things like, you know, a gravity table, you know, requires a certain quantity of seed for it to function effectively. But also, uh, you know, 
uh, many seed tools will, you know, as you start looking at larger pieces of equipment, there's always an investment in cleaning out that equipment between lots of seed. And the larger the piece of equipment, the more time you spend cleaning it. So if you have lot, you know, if you have small lots of seed, meaning, you know, small individual batches of seed from different varieties, using small tools that have relatively little amount of time that you need to spend cleaning out can be more efficient than, you know, using large tools that have this large investment of time required to clean them out between batches. Finally, uh, record keeping is a big part of improving your ability to clean seed on a year by year basis. Understanding, you know, what you did and what worked well in, in as much detail as possible is going to help you do better next year. And, and, and we'll see that as we go through the equipment, but things like recording what size screen you used, you know, what setting of, you know, fan speed did you use? Um, you know, what uh, kind of iteration of, you know, pieces of equipment, you know, what order did you clean the seed in? What worked and what didn't, um, you know, then next year when you, you know, come to that same seed crop, you'll save a lot of time and effort and be able to improve year over year if you are able to keep good records. As I mentioned before, I'm going to start this by going through a brief overview of the seed cleaning process. So first step is threshing. And threshing is essentially just the process of, in some way, separating the seeds from breaking the seeds free of the plant. And so this can be, you know, sh some way of forcing the pods, if they're enclosed in pods, the pods to shatter, or if they're, you know, naked seeds that don't exist in a pod, you know, having a way to break them off from the plant. Um, and <laughs> this does not necessarily, you know, mean that you're, you're, separating them in the sense of getting the seed clean um, in, in, in a different place than the rest of the non-seed material on the plant. It's just a matter of, you know, breaking it free is the first step, and that's called threshing. Then at that point, when we're talking about uh, dry seeded crops, meaning, you know, seeds that are um, enclosed in uh, dry uh, fruits rather than you know, wet seed crops that are enclosed in wet fruits, then the, there's there's two primary tools that are used. And again, Michaela is going to discuss this in much more detail when we start talking about equipment. But basically, you can take advantage of the difference between the seeds and non-seed material in terms of their size by screening. And you can take advantage of the difference between seed and non-seed material in terms of their density by winnowing. So screening is the process of using, as you might have guessed, screens to separate seed from non-seed material. You can usually do this one of two ways. You can, if you can use screens that are um, sized so that the, um, the seeds fall through the screens, but the non-seed material, the chaff, stays on top of the screen. That's called a top screen. And you can use screens that are sized so that the uh, dust and very small debris falls through the screen while keeping the seed on top of the screen. And those are called bottom screens. And you can get screens in all sizes um, and shapes and materials. And uh, Mikhail is going to cover some of that when we talk about equipment. This is a, an indent cylinder, and this is kind of along the lines of separating by size. These are This is a tool that has uh, dents in the cylinder, and those dents can be different depths and can hold seed, uh, you know, based on how large it is, and then um, and, and separate it from things that are uh, a different size than it. And then, as I mentioned, the separate, the second main tool for cleaning dry seeded crops is winnowing, so separating based on fact that seed is generally going to be denser than the non-seed chaff material. And again, here's where, you know, working up front to make sure that you don't have dirt and rocks and weed seed in can really pay off because, um, you know, 
the, the leaves and dried stems of the plant can very easily be blown away by fans in this winnowing process, but it's harder to separate out, um, you know, dirt and rocks in this process. So you can see basically that the, the gist of this is that you have some kind of airflow that you're pouring the seeds uh, across and the light material, then, you know, which is going to be your, you know, either non-seed material or your, you know, lightweight seeds that tend to be, you know, either, you know, immature or poorly germinating, you know, will also get blown away by the fan where the seed material will, the, the good dense seeds will fall uh, more rapidly and what can be caught by these bins. So for wet seeds, so seeds encased in wet fruits like tomatoes, cucumbers, uh, squash, these go through a slightly different process. So first thing that you're going to be doing is harvesting fruit that are uh, fully ripe and then in some way essentially threshing uh, the wet seed crops, so breaking up those fruits so that the um, seeds are um, free of the, you know, of the fruit. Um, so you can see here that he's pushing this through some hardware cloth into a bucket or you could just be, you know, have this you know, put all these fruits into a, a bucket and, and, you know, smash them with a, um, with a, a shovel or a stick, um, you know, or you'll see Michaela will demonstrate, or I guess actually I will demonstrate when we get to wet seed equipment. Um, there are some larger tools that can do the same job. Um, and then after that, if you're dealing in particular with cucumbers and tomatoes, they have a gel around the seed and what you can do to remove that gel is go through a fermentation process. And so this essentially is where you're putting this in a container and allowing the sugars that are contained within the pulp to ferment. This depend, depending on the temperatures is usually going to be a two or three day process. Uh, you want to keep the temperatures relatively warm and um, stir these on a regular basis. And then after a couple of days, what you'll see is that the um, those gel coats will dissolve from the tomatoes and cucumber seeds and the um, good uh, high germinating seed will fall into the bottom of the container and then on top you'll have pulp and immature seeds. Um, and at that point you can do what's known as rinsing and decanting which essentially just means add water to the container, pour that water off um, and keep on pouring until just about you, you start to see all those good heavy seeds at the bottom of the container and they're about to pour out of your container. Stop at that point, add more water, give it a quick stir, let the heavy seeds settle back down to the bottom and then pour it off again until you're just about to pour off the good seeds. Stop, add more water and repeat this process until all you have is water and clean seeds. And then you can pour off those seeds into a uh, into a screen, as you can see on the picture on your right, and then take those and put them on uh, in a thin layer on a screen to dry and stir them as they're drying so they don't stick together and there's no kind of wet spots that you know are a place where the seeds might germinate or, or mold. So quick note that you know this fermentation process is pretty universally done in the organic seed world for tomatoes and cucumbers. You can also apply this process to other uh, to uh, other wet seeded crops such as squash that do not have that gel around the seeds. It makes it a little easier to clean because it dissolves all the all the pulp, all the placental tissue. Um, however, you want to uh, decrease the amount of time that the fermentation process is happening for because that fermentation can potentially eat away at the seed coat and do damage to the quality of the seed. So at this point, I'm going to hand the controls over to Michaela and she's going to walk you through the uh, equipment that's appropriate for dry seed crops. Thank you, Jared. Um, Okay, as Jared mentioned, we're going to walk through a few examples of equipment that is used to go through the threshing, screening, and winnowing process of seed cleaning. And I'm going to share a couple different scales. 
Uh, and in particular, in this webinar, we're going to focus on some of the smaller scale DIY homemade equipment that um, farmers have invented to accomplish threshing, winnowing, or screening on farm. And as Jared mentioned earlier, one of the reasons that there are so many on-farm innovations, particularly in organic seed production, is that organic producers are growing a wide diversity of crops and using larger scale equipment requires uh, both an investment in that equipment, the monetary side, but also a certain scale of production to make the larger scale equipment effective. So where we would love to see more organic seed available and grown in larger scale, there's also this sort of intermediate level where the hand screening and hand winnowing may be prohibitive and um, figuring out a way to more efficiently clean seed without making the leap to uh, an investment in large scale equipment is, is a need. So this is a topic that we've had several requests of information on and uh, thought we would use this webinar as an opportunity to share some of the on-farm innovations in seed cleaning. I will also mention that anybody who's listening to this webinar, if you have examples from your farm of equipment that you've invented and you'd like to share it with the world, please email me photos and a little description. And at the end of the webinar, I can add some of those photos to this presentation before it's archived online. So with that, we'll start with talking a little bit about threshing. Uh, threshing is just breaking up the seed material from the plant material. And as you can see, some seed crops require quite a bit of pressure to thresh. And uh, an example, I think this might be a radish seed crop. Radish has very thick styrofoam pods and uh, driving over it with a truck is often applied because it takes so much friction to break open those pods. But every type of seed, every species, and even um, varieties within a species will have different tolerances to pressure and threshing. So one of the things you need to be careful of is that you are using appropriate threshing techniques for your seed crop. And what I mean is that it's breaking apart the plant material without damaging the seed. Some seeds can um, withstand quite a bit of pressure and some will actually split. If you think about your peas and beans and soybeans, they can more readily split, particularly if they're very, very dry when you do the threshing. Uh, other crops are somewhat moist and have an oil content and can be a little sensitive to getting crushed, like brassica seed. If you apply too much pressure, it will crush open. So uh, I just advise folks to try something and then take a good look at the effect before you apply it to the whole crop. So essentially, uh, combines are the common, very large scale piece of equipment that is used for threshing. The reason that they're called combines is they actually act as a reaper, a thresher, and a winnower all in one piece of equipment, but obviously they require a fairly large scale of operation Immuted. to apply. And there are, um, clearly different sizes of combines and in research fields and some smaller scale farms, uh, farmers use what's called a plot combine, which is a smaller size uh, combine that's pretty effective on a smaller scale of operation. They're also a bit pricey, uh, but that's something to look for if you're on a smaller scale looking for something that you can use to actually field thresh. Um, in the lower right hand corner here is an example of a what kind of combine is that? I can't remember, I'm sorry. Uh, but it's a much smaller scale combine that pulls behind a tractor. And so it's also appropriate for sort of a field scale operation where you uh, have room to turn around at the end of the rows and, and are a little bit smaller in the vegetable seed industry. A belt thresher is another form of, of threshing and a smaller scale. This is a community operated belt thresher that we share with the organic farm school over on Whidbey Island. And it's small enough that it fits in the back of a horse trailer and can be brought from one farm to another. And yet it's, it's quite effective. It, um, it has two different layers of belts that you can adjust the thickness between the belts. And so you feed the plant material with the seeds still attached into the hopper at the top as this woman is doing. 
uh, amber, this woman. And uh, as it comes, it goes through those two belts. The belts uh, can be adjusted for the amount of pressure they're applying. And what comes out the other side in the bin is the plant material with the seed broken off of the plant material. And this is another thresher, just a little bit larger scale, another belt thresher. And you can see more clearly here where the, the two uh, rotating belts uh, can be adjusted in the width that's between the two of them to adjust the amount of pressure that's being applied. And on this one, when it comes out the end, there is actually a little screen uh, mechanism where that plant material is collecting on the top and the seed is falling through that screen and being collected in a bucket down below. Uh, this is a efficient and, and fairly affordable piece of threshing equipment that can often be found uh, as used equipment to apply to your farm. As I said, farmers are the consummate uh, agricultural engineers and a lot of seed cleaning equipment that's been modified is being adapted from other farm equipment that's available. And the chipper shredder is an example of, of one piece that's been applied to many crops. Uh, in particular, there's some uh, instructions online from Washington State University from Carol Miles program on how to modify a chipper, sh a chipper sh shredder uh, to clean bean seed on farm. So uh, as you can imagine, it's just a series of, of very effective tines that break up the dry plant material and release the seed material. And uh, my understanding is though, it, again, it you need to test it out and make sure it's not also breaking up your seed material. So it works better for some crops than others. You'll also see in some of these slides, there are web addresses at the bottom of the page. And these are links that you can follow later at your leisure to look at uh, some YouTube demonstrations of the various pieces of equipment that we're uh, sharing with you today. Hand threshing, also very effective. You can see in this uh, um, slide that using a screen this is just hardware cloth very affordable and very easy to build at home using a screen that has a nice wide lip a nice thick frame is handy when you're using a screen for threshing purposes i often like to wear nice thick gloves and if you're threshing something that's particularly rough i, I like to buy welding gloves that have the nice long um thick arm coverage and a, a very thick uh, leather pad in the palm. That can be very handy if you're threshing all day long, your hands can get pretty sore. But particularly, this is an onion seed crop. And as I was mentioning, some seeds are more sensitive to threshing. Uh, in, in that case, hand threshing is advisable so that you're able to adjust the amount of pressure being applied. And onion seed is one of those crops that tends to be easily damaged in the threshing process and not need that much of uh, pressure applied. Another on-farm innovation, this is a deburring uh, five-gallon bucket that, that has been created on-farm to deburr carrot seed. So when you grow carrots, it still has, when you harvest the seed and clean the seed, it still has little ons on the side of the seed which act like a little burr and make it very difficult to then put that seed into a seed planter and have the seed run smoothly through the planter. So one farm that we work with, Nash's Organic Produce, that grows quite a bit of their own carrot seed, invented this uh, on-farm innovation to deburr the seed before they plant. So just taking off the little ons so that you have nice smooth carrot seed before you plant. When you buy carrot seed from a seed company, they've already done this with the deburring machine in the seed processing facility. So the way this five gallon bucket works is there's just a number of screws that have been inserted in the side of the bucket. And what you see down the middle is a paint paddle. So this is just hooks up to a hand drill and uh, connects through the top of the bucket and then that paddle uh, rotates through the bucket and the seed is then inside and it just uh, does enough threshing within the bucket to break the ons off of the seed before planting. 
this is an all crop. I think that was an all crop that I was showing you in the combine slide earlier as well. And this is a, can be driven through the field, pulled behind a tractor, but also operated in a stationary fashion. So if you've harvested your seed and let it dry, you can just uh, fork it into the all crop and it will do threshing and uh, break that up pretty effectively as well. So once the crop is threshed, you now have plant material, debris, and seed all mixed together. And the next step is to actually clean and separate the seed from the plant material. And uh, one of the most effective methods is through screening, which is just separation by size. And you can certainly create screens out of a lot of different materials, hardware cloth, obviously, is. Uh, one that we've already shown that's very affordable and accessible from a local hardware store. You can also buy uh, professional seed cleaning screens. And we have a couple of links at the bottom of this page of some sites where you can buy both seed cleaning screens, as well as on the Southern Exposure site, there's some information about how to build your own frames on farm to build your own seed cleaning screens. And one of the nice things about buying material and building your own is you can adjust the size. Some farmers, these are about a 12 by 12 inch by 12 inch size screen, but some farms like to use much larger screens, particularly if you have a larger volume. And so you can build uh, any custom size you want, uh, build a larger screen that you can fit across a table so that you can hold it up on the top of a frame of a table rather than um, having to hold it with your hands. And if you buy uh, commercial uh, seed cleaning screens, they are sized in 64 of an inch. So the whole opening on the screen, at a size one screen would be 1 64 of an inch, a two is 2 64 of an inch, et cetera. And that's a measurement that is consistent in the seed cleaning industry to um, uh, match up the size of the seed that you need to clean with the appropriate screen to be used. As Jared mentioned, the more debris you can leave in the field, the less mesh you'll have in your greenhouse or barn or wherever you bring your seed crop in to finish cleaning. And this is just a, a, a plastic crate that's very effective for using in the field to do what's called scalping. Scalping is just uh, taking off all the large sticks and stalks and, and, and plant material uh, and reducing it down to the smaller size debris that's left that you would then bring in for finished cleaning. Uh, this is just another photo of hand screening and you can see um, this is in this case I think being used to capture the seed on the top of the screen and uh, sift out any of the smaller debris below the screen. Screens are also uh, useful for sorting the size of the seed and when you buy seed from uh, a commercial company they've often sized the seed so that when you buy seed you're getting very uniform seed size and again those sizes are ranked in 64 of an inch so when you buy a carrot seed that is a number eight size carrot seed that means that it's the size of the carrot seed that fit through an eight sixty four of an inch screen and this is very effective for farmers to then have a more uniform seeding in the field. If you have a uniform size seed, it's easier to set your field planter to a certain size and get an even stand in the field. But that's something you can also accomplish on farm. Uh, the next method is winnowing and that we'll cover and so screening is separating by size winnowing is separating by specific gravity so the weight of the seed is uh, going to differentiate the larger heavier higher quality seed from the lighter weight chaff and the smaller size seed that might not have as as mature or full of an embryo and might not be as heavy as size of seed so larger heavier seed within a given seed crop is higher quality seed than the lighter weight seed. And this is one of the hardest things for beginning seed growers to wrap their mind around that you don't want to save every seed 
that gets harvested. You want to save the fraction of the seed that's going to have a higher germination rate and a higher longevity. So winnowing is just um, uh, one of the uh, most commonly applied methods and this square box fan is really the right hand seed cleaning tool of pretty much every seed saver and seed farmer that I know and it's so effective because um, it it can be scaled uh, it you can run a lot of seed across the front of a fan quite quickly it's very easy to clean up afterwards so if you're growing a lot of different seed crops as Jared mentioned when you're using equipment you have to clean that equipment out between each crop so that you don't have seed mixing happening um, the fan is one of the quickest ways to clean seed and I remember years ago Frank Mark Morton at Wild Garden Seed had a clean off where he had a competition with a piece of equipment, a machinery that somebody was trying to convince him would be more effective for cleaning his lettuce seed. And he said, I can clean just as fast as that piece of equipment and it's quieter too. So um, many farms have started with the box fan and then after years of working in front of the box fan, you have a lot of time and to, uh, to think about how to improve the system. And so here's a on-farm innovation with a cardboard box because the fan will tend to have a certain direction or wind tunnel of, of uh, the air that's being applied. And when you put this um, box around it, it then concentrates the uh, airflow more uniformly so that you have a more effective, uh, consistent application of air to the seed that you're dropping in front of the box. Uh, a lot of growers have also found that using a um, a bucket that is flat on one side, so this is actually a used plastic bucket of baby wipes, has a nice flat surface on one side of it, is more effective because the seed that falls in front of the fan is falling in a consistent uh, single plane or a flat plane uh, in front of the fan. So each of the seeds that are falling in front of it have an equal chance at getting caught by that wind. Where if you're dumping seed out of, in some, from a rounded bucket, then there's more of a tendency for there to be differential densities of the seed in front of the fan. And what gets blown furthest away might be partly by chance of where it was coming out of the bucket. Again, the flat bottom dispensers are quite effective for getting that even flow. Uh, if you're in a place with a nice breeze, it is quite lovely to fan outdoors. There's a lot less mess and a lot less chaff to be breathing in. And again, that's less seed that you have to haul inside and, and uh, handle uh, indoors if you can do some of that initial fanning in the field. This piece of sheet metal in the middle is also quite effective so that the seed is caught in one bucket or another and not uh, caught in between the two buckets and, and uh, falling outside of the bucket. It also creates just sort of a clean point to differentiate the heavy and the lighter weight seed. So you can adjust how close your buckets are to the fan. You can adjust how far, how high you're dropping the seed from, and you can watch the stream of seed hitting this metal divider and decide visually how much seed, you know, where you want to place your hands in order to cut off the lighter weight seed from the heavy seed. And it's effective to kind of try this and then stop and take a look at the seed that's falling in the bucket, hold it up, uh, break it open, see if you are actually capturing the heavy seed or if you still have too much debris. And as you can see in this photo, there's also numbers along the side that's also as Jared was saying, in your record keeping, effective to be uh, calibrating yourself to how heavy or, or light of a separation you're making by where you place your hand over those buckets in front of the fan. And of course, box fans have rheostats on them, or they have uh, speeds on them. You can also modify box fans to have a rheostat, which gives you a more infinite variability in the speed of the of the air coming through 
uh, the fan. This is a invention that was made by Mark Lutera called the Winnow Wizard. And uh, there are, um, uh, he does have a website where you can go and, and take a look at this uh, winnowing equipment that he has constructed. And he also has a service that he will make these for people for a fee or give you the plans to make them yourself for a smaller price. And the way the Winnow Wizard works, it's essentially just like the box fan, but the seed comes in the hopper at the top. And then as you can see, there's a, a second um, layer here that's suspended. So as the seed comes in the hopper above this lower piece of wood, it then uh, falls onto a, uh, a flat surface. So again, going back to that flat uh, baby white bucket distributes the seed evenly into a stream in front of the fanning unit. And in this case, the fan is uh, a, a specialized type of fan that is a little stronger and more effective and provides an even stream of air. And you can see the motor of the fan in the back of this piece of equipment. And if you'll notice at the bottom, he also has two layers of the uh, divider of the um, sheet metal divider that I was pointing out in the in the two bucket system earlier and you can adjust your buckets how deep they are going in or out of the um, underneath of the fanning outlet and in this way you can and quite easily modify both your airspeed where your buckets are sitting in relation to the fan and then feed your seed into the hopper on the top and not have to stand there holding a plastic bucket in front of the fan. So just a, a modification here for a more sophisticated piece of equipment to do the same thing um, as the winnower, but a little more efficiently. And there's instructions for where to find his information online. Um, this is another fan modification from Beth Raskershek at Counter County Canyon Bounty Farm. And Beth said, I couldn't stand standing in front of a bucket or of a fan holding a bucket all day long. I just wanted to multitask. So she had a friend just create this metal frame and metal hopper so that she can load it up with the seed and then adjust it and have it set. And then she can walk away and be doing something at the same time while she's accomplishing her winnowing. There are also several pedal powered or crank powered threshers available online. A couple of different sources are Planting Seeds Project in Canada and they have uh, small scale equipment like what you see here available for sale. And then there are some new plans that have recently been put up on Farm Hack that are about how to create your own pedal powered thresher on farm. So check out Farm Hack Dot org and look for plans on pedal pedal threshers and pedal winnowers. Uh, this is a gravity table, larger scale piece of equipment for winnowing. The, and again, this is for larger scale operations, but the seed comes in the hopper at the top. There's fans in the body of the piece of equipment that lift the air chaff through the top of this deck and you can adjust the tilt of the deck, the speed of the air, and then also the dividers at the front of the deck so that the seed, uh, lighter weight seed is lifted off the table and floats downhill and comes out in one bucket and the heavier seed stays in contact with the deck and gravitates uphill and then comes out in another bucket. And there are several uh, YouTubes and information online you can find on the gravity table and this is for larger scale operations. Gravity table in operation, as Jared said, you have to have enough quantity of seed to fill this piece of equipment uh, completely in order for the separation to be effective. This is an aspirator, so essentially another winnowing device that the seed comes in the hopper on the left-hand side of this photograph, and there's a squirrel cage fan in the center, and so you adjust the airspeed of the squirrel cage so that it blows strong enough that the lighter weight seed coming in, coming out of the hopper is lifted up and over the top of the, um, of the channel and the heavier seed comes, it uh, drops down into the bucket below. So 
the outlet that's on the right hand side would have the lightweight portion and on the left hand side would have the heavier portion. This is a picture of a homemade aspirator that uh, has been, there's several different versions that have been constructed and this is, this one has plans online that you can look up and they have more photos and information about how it works but essentially you attach a uh, shop vac to that yellow cylinder at the top and so it creates a draw of air and that air speed can be adjusted by opening and closing the hole openings on the front of the piece of equipment and again the seed comes into the hopper and you adjust the air so that the heavy seed drops and the lighter seed is pulled up and over and comes out the outlet on the right side of that um, photograph. This is a spiral separator, separates based on gravity as well, but this, it separates in particular round seed from non-round seed. And as the seed comes in the hopper and falls by gravity down these spirals, the uh, round seed spins faster and goes to the outer side of the um, spiral. And the non-round seed tends to stay toward the center and then it uh, comes out into two different extractions at the bottom of the piece of equipment. Um, we only have about 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna hand it over now to Jared to talk a little bit about some of the on-farm wet seed extraction tools that have been developed. All right, thank you so much. So I will um, quickly go through the, some of the tools for dealing with wet seed crops. So thinking about this in terms of process the first thing that you're going to be trying to do is extract the seeds uh, from the fruits so essentially talking about you know in a way parallel to threshing and dry seeds uh, you can see you can use uh, you can slice fruits you can scoop them with uh, as you can see like little ice cream scoops here um, I, I don't have a picture of it but another way I've seen people kind of rapidly extract what seed from the fruits is with uh, actually with a shop back um, by you know slicing uh, the fruits in half and then just sucking out the seeds with the shop back and it entering into the um, you know the the containment part of the shop back and then you can then you know move that into a bucket for the next steps. Um, some other ways to extract seed uh this is for a uh, zucchini or you know summer squash you, you know this is uh, farmer bill reynolds here having set up just a uh you know the head of a, a mall here on uh, plywood and then would we'll just slice the ends and then can just shove that through and it will split it in half and then he uh once it's split in half he's got a um you know a metal bracket here that he can just slide the half fruit over and it will scoop uh, the seeds out and then that falls into a bucket that you can't see um, down below them. So that's kind of a, a rapid way to process through uh, a lot of, uh, you know, long skinny squash. Um, it's another uh, Bill Reynolds uh, tool here for splitting winter squash, which can often be a challenge to, to split cleanly in a rapid fashion here. He can just drop them onto this ax head and then they split in half and then he can subsequently scoop them out. At a larger scale, um, many wet seed growers use something known as a vine thresher, <coughs> which uh, you can't quite see in this picture, but it starts with a, um, you know, basically with a, there, there's a, a threshing, uh, head at the front that would be kind of you know analogous to a, a you know a, a chipper that or depending on the design or just a kind of rolling cylinder that crushes the fruit and so the fruit comes in and gets crushed and then it falls into this rotating cylinder here and then as the cylinder spins seed will fall through the grating and the fruit will fall out or the rest of the, the the fruit will fall out in terms of cleaning wet seed uh as we talked about previously the most common way for cleaning the seed after fermentation process is with rinsing and decanting 
but at a larger scale, uh, a common tool is actually a, a sluice box. And this is essentially very uh, similar to what gold miners have used in, uh, you know, in kind of early day mining. And it takes advantage of the idea, again, that seed is heavy and will tend to uh, get stuck behind uh, baffles in this sluice box and the light seed and pulp will float over the baffles. And I think I have a closer picture on the next slide. But as you can see, um, this is a fairly water intensive process. So, you know, Bill here uh, doing this in the rainy season in Humboldt County, California, a very wet place. So, you know, water isn't really an issue for him um, having access to a well where there's plenty of water. Um, but, you know, if you're in a place where water is at a premium, then this may be less appropriate. So let me show you a closer up picture. So here you can see there's a series of baffles and you can adjust, uh, you know, depending on how you build this sluice box. I mean, you can see this is fairly simply constructed, but you can adjust the height of the baffles, but you can also adjust the angle of incline or decline of the sluice box and you can adjust you know how much water you're putting into it and that'll determine you know you can see kind of the light seed and pulp floating over the top of those baffles while the heavy seed getting caught behind each baffle and then um, once you're the seed is you know once you've filled up the baffles and the seed is sufficiently clean then you can more aggressively just um, either lift, you can either lift the baffles out or just, you know, increase the amount of water flow that's coming until it starts to actually push the heavy seed out and get caught here at the basket at the bottom. A tool that is, was originally built for uh, pepper seed uh, on a kind of small scale or small to medium scale but can also be used for some other uh, kind of softer uh, wet seeded crops like tomatoes and cucumbers is a millet wet seed separator. And so the way that this works is it's got kind of a, a threshing box here <coughs> at the top that will macerate the fruit and then that will get put out um, onto the screen and then it uh, has these the sprayer bar that pushes the seed through the screen, leaving the uh, flesh on top of the screen. And then you can see um, here Bill demonstrating he'll actually set this up in parallel with his sluice so that as the seed uh, leaves the millet, it can get a secondary cleaning in his sluice box. And then, as you can see, you know, one of the things with many of these wet seed crops is you'll often go through. A wet seed cleaning process but it will not be uh, fully clean and then once you get the seed dry you're going to still probably go through the dry seed um, cleaning process so you'll still you know take this and you know winnow and or screen it to get some of the little pieces of flesh that weren't um, removed in the wet seed process so <clears throat> one final tool uh, that can be used for cleaning uh, generally cleaning dry seed, but actually using a water process is floating seed. And so one of the <coughs> final ways that you can separate seed from non-seed material, again, is because seed is dense, you you know, the good seed, just like we talked about in the wet seed process, tends to sink, whereas, you know, immature seed and sticks um, and other pieces of chaff will float. So what you can do, um, with certain seed crops is even if it's a dry seed, you can add water. And as you can see here, the chaff is floating on top and can be, you know, you can follow the rinse and decanting process basically to pour off that um, light chaff. And then at that point, you'll end up with a relatively clean, heavy seed here. So this you need to be careful about because you are wetting a uh, dry seed and this can, you know, put the seed at risk of, uh, you know, both germinating and, you know, uh, disease beginning to grow on it. So you really want to, if you do this process, generally recommendation is you're only going to want to do it one time. And you're going to want to pretty immediately um, get it out and uh, dry. 
this is a, another way to dry seed that's gone through a wet seed process. This is a, this is again from uh, Bill Reynolds, a seed grower in California, and uh, this is a you know a dryer. So he does it loose. Um, I have heard of people you know putting this say in a you know mesh bag or you know a pillowcase, something like that to hold it contained. Um, and just putting this, you can either remove, you know, remove the heating element to ensure that this is just putting in um, air and rotation to dry it. And you'll dry it, um, not completely dry, but, you know, as you saw, kind of this, this came right out of Bill's sluice box. And so this, you know, seed came in here fairly wet. So he's getting it part of the way uh, dry in a rapid fashion in this dryer um, with Bill. Because it's not in a pillowcase, he'll actually um, remove this from the, the dryer with the, the shop vac. But if you had it contained, then you wouldn't have um, to go through that step. And then once it's part of the way dry out of the dryer, then you would be spreading it out again on screens to get it all the way dry. So those are some of the tools and, uh, you know, uh, uh, do-it-yourself pieces of equipment that people have bought or built or cleaning seed. However, there are many, many more inventions out there. Um, if you have questions, you can uh, I'll ask us right now in this webinar, but if you don't think of it at this moment, you can email us later. Uh, again, we covered just a very brief uh, portion of the description of the seed cleaning process. So if you want more details on that process, generally you can check out last year's webinar. And I wanted to make a pitch to encourage all of you to come to the Organic Seed Growers Conference. This is an opportunity to really learn from other seed growers face to face, hear what kind of things that they've used to succeed in getting their seed clean. And uh, at this point, I'd like to open it up to questions. And also, if anyone has any uh, unmuted of equipment that they've bought or built that have really helped them in their seed cleaning, uh, this could be a good time to share any resources with other webinar attendees. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Jared and Michaela. Um, it, we did have one question from before the webinar, um, and that was from a lady who was hunting a moose today and therefore couldn't make it to the webinar. And she was interested in knowing about how to clean amaranth seeds. So if you could comment on that while we get some more questions, that'd be great. Sure, Jared, do you want to take that or do you sure. want me to? Yep, no, I'll, 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 I can dig it. So. Okay. Amaranth, uh, I'd be curious to hear from the question asker kind of what the challenges were. Generally, I found amaranth to be a relatively easy seed to clean. Um, amaranth has very small seeds. And so as long as you are, you know, able to make sure that you're, you know, the material that you have going in is, you know, nice and dry and well threshed um, so that it's all broken free of, um, you know, the non-seed material, then, you know, there's a couple of, of pretty straightforward tools. I mean, one, because it's such a small, small seed, if you have access to a uh, appropriately sized screen, you'll be able to get, you know, the amaranth seed to fall through and, and, and get quite a bit of the non-seed material out of it. And in fact, that's probably what I would do as a first step. Just because it's such a small seed, if your ratio of chaff to seed is still really high. You know, if you've got a lot of chaff and just a little bit of seed hiding in there, sometimes that can make it a little bit harder with a really small seed like that. So I would, you know, as my first step, try and find the smallest um, screen that you could to let the seed through and, 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 you know, again, reduce as much of that volume of non-seed material out. Once you've gotten to the point where you're, you know, dealing more with mostly seed and, you know, a little bit of chaff, you know, then you can move on to screening and just, you know, make sure that, you know, you follow some of the tips that we've recommended, you know, use uh, uh, a flat bottom container. So you're pouring the seed in a single sheet. That way, you know, the seed is getting kind of equal uh, airflow across all of them and make sure because it is a relatively small seed, just, you know, as you're as you're learning, make sure you've got you know containers uh, set up so that you don't you know blow your seed away. Um, but 
I think one of the, the, the tricks, and, you know, it's hard without physically demonstrating it, but one of the, the, the keys with seed cleaning is uh, being willing to kind of be a little bit aggressive in your winnowing. So being willing, you know, once you get a feel for, you know, making sure your containers are in the right place and, and uh, you know, ready to catch, uh, I guess, wayward seeds that blow too far, um, hold your container up pretty high relative to the fan and, you know, so that way you're maximizing the ensuring that the seed is really passing through the full airstream because the, the longer that that seed and chaff is in contact with that airstream, just the more separation you can get. Okay, great. Kayla, if you've got any other tips. Okay. No, I just might add just in case it's her question. Um, before the cleaning process, you can cut the whole stalk of amaranth, cut the whole flower head, and lay it out to dry. Bring it inside somewhere where it'll really dry down. And you can do that as soon as you see the seed starting to shatter and fall. When the seed is readily coming off the plant, then you know you have mature seed on the plant. At that point, you can cut the whole stalk lay it out on a, a tarp or on a screen or somewhere where where you can catch any seed that falls through, but let the plant dry down completely. And then you can just easily thresh it once the plant material is dry, just by running your hands over the stalk with a leather glove or um, stomping on it on a tarp or beating it into a bucket or something like that to get it to the initial thresh stage before the cleaning. Okay, great. Um, we have questions about a couple more crops here. Um, here's a listener who is currently threshing flax seeds during the webinar with his four-year-old. Um, harvesting has been the most labor-intensive part so far, so do you have any tips for harvesting flax easily? I have not grown flax, and I think commercially it's combined, right? Do you know anything about flax seed, Jared? No, I, I, I remember when I was working for uh, Nash Huber, we had a flax seed crop, but I wasn't involved in harvesting it. So I, I unfortunately can't uh, provide any good advice on, on harvesting flax seed. I'm wondering if it's stuck in the, in the bracts. I'm wondering if, it's, if they're having difficulty separating the plant material from the seed itself. Is that the issue? Okay. Um, if, you, if the guy who ask that question um, might want to give us a little more detail if you can um, please feel free to type that in and meanwhile we'll go to another question on whether you have any pointers on echinacea seeds um, this person says the seed is quite soft so it breaks apart easily and it's the same size and relative weight as some of the chap so um, have any tips on that yeah well I, I think that it it often happens when you're cleaning seed that once you go through that initial threshing process, that's one of the challenges is when your plant material is the same size and weight as your seed. And sometimes what works is, is after that initial threshing and the initial cleaning, when you're stuck at that point, lay it out the, the smaller amounts of chaff that are still the same size and weight as the seed, lay that seed with the chaff out to dry again and put a fan on it and really get the plant material dried down. And then at that point, you can gently go through a second threshing and eventually the dried plant material should break up into a smaller size and be easier to then screen or winnow off of the seed. Okay, thank you. Um, do you want to add anything there, Jared? No, that's great advice. Okay, sounds good. All right, um, we don't have any more questions in the queue, but I'll just give another minute or so just in case somebody's busy typing. Um, and meanwhile, I'm just going to uh, mention again that there's a handout of the slides here. Okay, good, we did hear back. Um, and then I just wanted to direct you to where you can find the archive here. So um, there's the archive link right there. And you can also Google the organic YouTube channel and you'll be able to find the previous webinars in the series and a whole lot of other webinars on organic seed production, which you might enjoy. Um, okay, so back to the flax grower here. Um, he says separating has been fine. It's just getting it in that's been tough. So do you recommend a scythe or just pulling the seed off the plant in the field? It's about 
um, five 50 foot beds and they harvested for six hours and only done half a bed. So um, I guess the challenge is really harvesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I mean, kind of on, on a medium scale, I mean, yeah, just depending on what you, what, you know, tools you have available to you and what storage space you have available to you. Um, you know, I, I, again, as I, I mentioned, I haven't had to clean flax. So I, you know, I don't know, um, you know, what the, what the, you know, whether it'd be easier just to try and, you know, get them stripped off the plants. Uh, one thing I've used uh, for kind of dealing on kind of that, that, you know, step up from, you know, super small hand scale is I've found, um, and obviously all, the, all caveats with safety involved, I've found, you know, a chainsaw, you know, can be a relatively straightforward tool for, you know, being able to quickly harvest, um, you know, on that kind of multiple bed scale like that. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if um, if if lax stalks might be too small and thin to use uh, the pressure of a chainsaw, but I would also recommend then experimenting a little bit with a scythe or with a hand sickle. Yeah, he actually wondered if a hedge trimmer might work. <laughs> Sure, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, so I mean, again, again, I don't want to recommend things that are unsafe. So, you know, all the, the various caveats there. But I mean, the, <laughs> yeah, a, a hedge trimmer. Yeah, uh, we've I've, I've used a hedge trimmer that I would say, you know, so I've, I've used hedge trimmers for, uh, yeah, for for, dry, you know, for small plots of wheat um, and for quinoa. Um, I've also used the, yeah, I mean, you know, the nice thing about, yeah, about a, bolt, but a head trimmer or, you know, a chainsaw is, you know, you just, or a scythe, as Michaela said, is, you know, that you've just got, you know, the, the longer the kind of cutting edge of it, the more, you know, you're going to be able to cut at one time compared to, say, a hand sickle. Um, you know, it just takes a little bit longer. Um, I, I mean, just to argue, not, not, not necessarily that the chainsaw is the tool, but I've, I've used it on, you know, some, I've, I've used it on, yeah, on, on quinoa that was very thin stemmed. So, um, it, it does. I love it. I feel like click and clack now. And not around the four year old. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, any ideas or techniques on how to clean stevia? Ooh, <laughs> no, but you can email me. Okay. And I, and I have somebody that I can ask. If you email me that question, I will uh, do a little bit of homework and respond unless Jared has some advice. Okay, yeah, there's I, my, I don't have any. Michaela's email is back up on the screen yeah. there. So yeah. All I right. do know I do know a uh, um, a stevia breeder, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Great. Um, one more question here. Um, thank you very much for some education in seed saving. Can you comment on the seed saving industries and are there very few operations now as seed companies merge under big corporations? So more of a political economic question that may get into on the next webinar, which will include some policy discussions. But um, if you want to take that question here. Sure, Jared, do you want to address that or you want me to touch on it? Um, I can do it real quick. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, the, the short answer is that there is, you know, has been for, you know, many, many decades now increased concentration and consolidation in the larger seed industry. Uh, one of the things that's exciting about or the organic seed world is that there is a fair degree of diversity of producers out there and certainly by getting involved yourself in organic seed production whether it's on a you know personal scale or community scale or you know commercial scale you can help contribute to that diversity i would say for kind of more of the nuts and bolts of how the organic seed industry looks and kind of some of the the, the bigger picture challenges of it i would encourage anyone to take a look at uh, Organic Seed Alliance's our State of Organic Seed Report. You can download that from our publications page, seedalliance.org. 
Great. Okay. Well, we've pretty much reached the end of our question period here. So I'd like to thank everyone who submitted a question and hope that you can join us all at the Organic Seed Growers Conference and also for our final webinar in this series um, of the year, which takes place on October 17th. So if you're already registered for any of the webinars or attended any of them, you don't need to register again. You'll just get an automatic reminder in your email and then you'll be able to attend if you're free and if not, we are recording all of the sessions. So thank you so much again, Jared and Michaela, and thanks to everyone for joining us.